<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia, and the, on behalf of the CMO board, I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming out today. I know that the events of this past week have been incredibly trying and difficult, and if you do not know what I am referring to, then maybe that is for the better. Um, <laughs> all, all jokes aside, though, uh, we uh, as a board really do believe that this discussion we are having today is incredibly important because if we want to continue to just move forward as a community, we have to listen to and try to understand every voice, um, especially those that are seldom heard. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker today, I also have a couple of housekeeping items. So first, uh, if you enjoyed this event or if you have any sort of feedback for us, uh, just come up to us after the show and give us your, e your email so that we can send out surveys afterwards. And on the same note, if you want to hear about uh, events that we're going to have in the future like this, we will have one next quarter. Please also just come by and give us your email so that we can add you to our list of and you'll be able to get those notifications. Uh, secondly, we have one more event coming up at the end of this quarter during reading period, which is our movie night. If you want help procrastinating on studying, I highly recommend you guys come by on the Thursday. And as for next quarter, we will be holding a panel event, which will be another discussion on the social issues in classical music featuring Imani Wins, who is our current ensemble in residence, and they are actually Grammy-nominated artists, so that would be really, really awesome. Yeah, that's right, I see your face. <laughs> um, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Ms. Talia Stokes, who has achieved an immense amount, both personally and professionally. As a teen, she uh, studied double bass with master musicians such as Dr. Jacqueline P uh, Pickett, <laughs> all right, and many more who I can't quite remember at the moment, but <laughs> she also graduated a summa cum laude from Western Michigan University with, and she has three degrees from there. So she has a bachelor's in uh, performance music, uh, bachelor's also in international studies, and she has also fluent in Mandarin Chinese and has studied in China and her master's degree from Western Michigan University is also in music and she studied Mongolian music in China and currently she is a PhD student here at the Department of Ethnomusicology where she continues to study Mongolian music so basically she is really amazing and we are incredibly lucky and thankful to have her today so Please join me in a warm round of applause for Ms. Talia Stokes. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, thank you all for coming to this event. Um, I, when I was approached to talk about this, um, I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to like, give a formal paper or just talk off the cuff or what have you. So I decided that I'm going to kind of meld the two. And I'm going to talk mostly about my personal experiences, but also things that I have researched in uh, those experiences as well. Uh, so this discussion is problematizing the intersections of class and race in American symphonic orchestras. And like I said, like the subtitle or subheading says, it's an informal discussion. And I'm going to talk about my personal experiences, but at the end of the talk, I would like, I'm going to ask some pretty big questions. And I don't know the answers to these questions. So this is not necessarily just me giving out information. It's something that I would like feedback on from people in the audience and whatnot. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, as our, has been already said, I've done a lot of stuff regarding music. I started playing bass when I was 12. Um, I studied under uh, Dr. Jacqueline Pickett in Atlanta, Georgia, and also Ralph Jones, who is the recently deceased um, principal bassist of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, um, as well as Tom Knifik, who is the head of the Jazz Studies Department at Western Michigan University, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I started getting into orchestra in sixth grade uh, when one of my friends, in, she had joined the orchestra and uh, was coming to class with her violin and bragging like, oh, look, you know, I can play violin, look at this. And I was like, well, I'm not doing anything, so yeah, why not? I'll do the orchestra. 
and that's when I joined, um, well, I joined technically in seventh grade. Uh, I remember <coughs> the exact day that I joined because it was 9-11. So that, I joined the orchestra on 9-11, that was the most memorable. I knew exactly where I was when that happened, as most people do when they, if they were um, old enough to remember that time. Uh, from then, I played, continued to play double bass in orchestras, um, doing <coughs> generally way too much, uh, participating in lots of orchestras and participating in a lot of different academic uh, or organizations and what have you. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, you'll get to know more about me as I continue on through the talk. So continuing through my experience in orchestra, like I said, I started in middle school, and this was in Salem, at Salem Middle School in Atlanta, Georgia, and this was on the southern side of Atlanta. Um, and why I'm giving this background will become clear in a moment. Um, from there, I, went, I moved to Cedar Grove Middle School, uh, also in the southern area of Atlanta, but in a much, I would say, safer uh, area than where Salem Middle School was. Uh, I continued uh, my orchestral studies at Cedar Grove Middle School and then DeKalb School of the Arts, which is a performing arts high school in Metro Atlanta that takes students not only from Metro Atlanta but the surrounding Atlanta area uh, because it is a magnet school, so all kinds of students from all over Atlanta are eligible to audition and attend that high school. Um, while I was in high school at uh, DSA, I was in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Talent Development Program, which is ASOTDP for short. Uh, this program is an organization put together by the, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra that's designed to uh, reach out to underrepresented uh, ethnic groups in, in, in middle and high school to encourage them to uh, play in orchestra play classical music and play classical instruments. So this main, their main focus were black and Latino students uh, within the Atlanta area. I also was a participant in the uh, Metropolitan Youth Symphony Orchestra, which is my so, and the DeKalb Symphony Orchestra. And this, the DeKalb Symphony Orchestra was a community orchestra. Um, it wasn't uh, a youth orchestra, it was a community orchestra. Um, as you can see, I did a lot. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, kind of the story of my life, just doing way too much. But uh, also during my high school time, I participated in all state orchestra uh, at, in Savannah, Georgia, and I participated in Suwannee Summer Music Camp that took place in Suwannee, Tennessee. I've done that, I did that, I think, three years in a row. Uh, from there, I was in the orchestra at Western Michigan University where I did my Bachelor of Performance degree along with my other degrees. Um, and what I have on here, uh, Inter-Mongolia Normal University, uh, when I was doing research for my master's thesis, um, one of the uh, people that I met, she uh, was extremely excited when she learned that I was a classical musician and she begged me to play with her orchestra um, because it really needed a bass player. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, I'll go. I'll go ahead and join. And this was at Inner Mongolia Normal University in Hukhut, Inner Mongolia, in China. Um, otherwise, in the school name in Chinese is Nei Mongol Shifan Dashue. Um, after that, now I'm here, <coughs> University of Chicago, uh, doing my PhD in ethnomusicology and in the symphony orchestra here. So. That is my orchestral time right there. And I bring this up to give my observations as a black person and also as a black woman, black girl, growing up into a black woman, participating in orchestras and symphonic orchestras uh, at the unprofessional level through the professional level. Um, when I was a kid at Salem Middle School, Cedar Grove Middle School, the schools that I went to were predominantly black. Uh, 
I would venture that the population was maybe 95, 96% black, <coughs> maybe a few Latinos, hardly any Asian students, and I don't think I saw one white student there. Um, and in saying that, Salem Middle School was also located in an area that had high incidence of poverty. And whereas Cedar Grove Middle School, even though it was also a predominantly black school, the students there were generally maybe working class or middle class, came from middle class families. Um, <coughs> when you look at professional orchestras today, around the world, around the country and around the world, Black and Latino performers are very much underrepresented groups in orchestras. And there is, when you talk to people, there is kind of a, an unfortunate stereotype that goes that Black and Latino students are, or people are underrepresented in symphonic orchestras because that's not part of the culture. That it's, that's just, Black and Latino people don't do classical music. It's a really, really unfortunate stereotype. There's a lot, in my opinion, a lot more and a lot more nuance to the reasons why black and Latino people are underrepresented in classical uh, music and symphonic orchestras. And I posit that that's due to more to class uh, and not necessarily completely race. I won't get on, I won't subscribe to the idea that classical music is not for black people. Classical music is not for Latino people. I, I will never subscribe to that because look at my life. I spent my entire life <laughs> in classical music and in orchestras. But what I will say is that classical music is more geared toward upper middle class and upper class cultures. And this phenomenon, I think, exists not only among uh, overrepresented groups in um, classical music, but also <laughs> underrepresented groups. Um, and I bring that up. I'm going to uh, move on to this episode of Atlanta, the TV show, uh, Juneteenth. And I want you all to see. Uh, what I mean in terms of a class difference, even within uh, racial groups. And I'm going to uh, <coughs> give a little bit of background about the episode. And after we watch this clip, uh, a few clips, then I'm going to give a little bit of background about my experience, specifically in the talent development program for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And I bring that up because that is my experience there was different than my experiences being in orchestras in in middle school, it was predominantly black communities, but they were also predominantly poor. Whereas in the ASO TDP, it was geared specifically towards black and Latino students, but these students generally came from wealthier, upper class families. So uh, this episode, uh, Atlanta, is an awesome show. I highly encourage any and everybody to watch it. It's fantastic. Um, but this particular episode, the main character and his not wife but mother of his child who he has an on and off again uh, relationship with. Uh, she is going to a party that's being hosted by a woman that she knows uh, to uh, <coughs> mingle and get some job prospects. Um, and this woman that she knows is a black woman who is in the upper class economic bracket, whereas uh, the main character's love interest, she's in, I would say, lower middle class or working class. Um, and I want you to see the, I, I really think that <coughs> the dynamics that are shown in this particular episode are really instrumental to the points that I'm trying to make as far as <coughs> in Latino people being involved in orchestras. Oh, I thought that would happen. <coughs> Just one moment, please. Here. <coughs> Is
Is the sound on? caught the awkwardness that was uh, in the relationship. It's pretty obvious, right? But the awkwardness, uh, not only that was embodied by Craig, but the awkwardness between uh, the uh, main couple and the people that they were there to see. Uh, this woman uh, who was talking about how 
She likes Craig, but she loves her money. And it, I would say, on a meta level, in terms of critiquing this episode, is a little heavy-handed. But on a personal level, this is this is a culture that I've encountered in my experience at being a black person in the orchestra and also interacting with other black people in orchestral or orchestral environments. It's not that black people and Latino people are underrepresented because they're black and Latino, not necessarily. That is a part of it. Let me, let me be clear about that, that racial, uh, systematic racial disparities exist in this country. It's a real thing that that's just what it is. However, within certain, I guess, cultural activities, especially symphonic, symphonic orchestras, this kind of dynamic, I think, also has to do with class. It has to do with class, uh, class identifications. Uh, I would say that in my time with the Atlanta Symphony Talent Development Program, I was glad that I was in this program and that I had access to a lot of these different uh, power structures within the Atlanta Symphony kind of organization. But I didn't feel comfortable interacting with other, the other black and Latino students that I met there because we came from different class backgrounds. And it seemed like we just couldn't quite align in that particular way. Uh, so I won't belabor that point, uh, but that is kind of a illustration of what I was talking about. Um, another point that I would like to make, but not necessarily flesh out uh, right now, is something that we can do in the discussion part, is that I think that this class dynamic can also be seen among the overrepresented uh, ethnic groups in orchestras, even among white people, white folks who participate in orchestras, if you, I would really like to do research into this, but I would gather that of the white people who participate in the major symphonic orchestras, they are from or cater to an upper middle class and <coughs> upper class community. Uh, whereas you have community orchestras that aren't as professional or uh, as highly regarded, where they uh, cater to a more working class or middle class community. Uh, that's why I say that it's very important to, dis uh, to at least consider issues of class when we're talking about representation in symphonic orchestras. Uh, now, moving on, I'm going to talk about Asianness in orchestra. <coughs> I want to give a caveat here. I am not Asian, obviously. Uh, so there's only so much that I can and should say about uh, what it means to be Asian in orchestra. I can't say what, what it means. But I can be a mouthpiece for others who have told me what their experiences were and are in uh, in orchestra, in symphonic orchestra, as well as uh, giving, uh, giving platforms to research that has already been done in, on this topic by Asians, uh, Asian Americans, and uh, Asians who are immigrants. Uh, my observations in the symphonic orchestras is that Asians tend to be overrepresented in symphonic orchestras. However, it's really important that we, need, uh, that we break down what it means to be Asian. There's an unfortunate stereotype that uh, orchestras consist of just Asian people. Asian people and white people and, oh, they're just all from China or something like that, something really like, racist. There, uh, if you will notice, when you look at professional orchestras, even if they are, they t even if they do tend to be overrepresented <coughs> by Asian people, this tends to be East Asian people. You don't see as much representation by Southeast Asian people or South Asian as an in Indian people or Pacific Islander people. And 
this kind of representation dynamic makes you wonder why that is. Why is it that East Asian people tend to be overrepresented in symphonic orchestras in the United States? And going further than that, among East Asian people, are they Asian Americans? Are they um, Asians, Asian immigrants to the United States? It's another layer of discussion that needs to be had when we're talking about increasing representation among different groups in symphonic orchestras. And I say that uh, out of personal experience, um, when I was doing my master's research in Inner Mongolia, like I said, uh, one of the people that I was working with, she was really pushing me to be in their orchestra. And she helped me a lot with my research. And this woman, uh, this young woman, she is uh, ethnically Mongol and nationally Chinese. Uh, and she helped me a lot with my research. With that, in turn, I helped her with her goal of getting to the United <coughs> States to pursue a master's degree in uh, music performance, in violin performance. Now, with that, she is East Asian, let's say. Ethnically, and uh, for my own purposes, I would call that uh, Central Asian. Uh, Mongols are Central Asian, in my opinion, but that's like splitting hairs. As far as most people are concerned, she would be considered East Asian and a Chinese immigrant to the United States. However, the fact that she is Mongol and was able to get to the United States in the first place is an extremely monumentous feat. Uh, most Chinese immigrants to the United States tend to be upper class people. They come from upper class backgrounds. They come from upper class economic situations. Getting into the United States as a Chinese citizen is extremely difficult. The uh, immigration visa process is very arduous and very long, and only a few are able to get through. Within that dynamic, uh, ethnic minorities in China, like Mongols, like Tibetans, like Uyghurs, it's even, even harder for them to get to here. So when we're talking about Asian immigrants to the United States, oh, they're all just Chinese. That's really not the case, obviously. That really is not the case at all. And it's something that those of us who are interested in these issues of representation in symphonic orchestras need to really hash out about these fine details. And that's on the side of uh, Asian immigrants, or East Asian immigrants, and that's not uh, even counting Asian Americans and the very <coughs> complicated uh, and very uh, numerous reasons that uh, Asian, an Asian American person might join an orchestra. Like I said, I'm not Asian. I'm not Asian American. So I can't speak to that. However, there are people who have and do talk about this. Um, so this first source, <coughs> musicians from a different so shore, Asians and Asian Americans in classical music, talks about uh, what I was just uh, problematizing just now. Um, this is by Mari Yoshihara. Now, for me, personally, the text is a little problematic on a meta level in that uh, Yoshihara talks mainly about East Asian uh, peoples. That would be Japanese, Chinese, and Korean peoples. Uh, she doesn't go into detail about Southeast Asian or South Asian participation. And uh, like I said, that's something that really needs to be talked about more. Uh, Speak It Louder, Asian Americans Making Music by Deborah Wong is a very fan fascinating book. Although I find uh, Deborah's uh, foray into talking about uh, Asians using rap music and rap culture as an identity, identity uh, forming mechanism, a little bit problematic. She <coughs> tends to treat rap culture as a monolith. Uh, and I don't think that she uh, approaches it very well. But beyond that, it's a very, very good book when talking about this uh, discussion. Um, 
and then this article, Performing chinese on the Western Concert Stage, The Case of Long Long, by Eric Hung, um, it talks about uh, two uh, Chinese classical musicians. Long Long is a violinist, I believe, and he, it, yeah. no, pianist? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is another one. <coughs> oh, Lee. <coughs> Let me just pull up the article so that I don't, so that I get it right. Yes. Yes, Li Yunbi, it's also a pianist. Um, Hung in this article compares how these two uh, Asian uh, classical musicians present themselves on a Western stage as being overtly Chinese or subtly Chinese. It's a very uh, interesting article and I would encourage uh, you all to read it. Um, and if you, want after the talk, I can give even more sources and whatnot if you're interested. Um, so with all of that, I have some pretty big questions. Uh, it is common knowledge that black and Latino representation in American symphonic orchestras ex is extremely limited. To what extent is this lack of representation due to an intersectionality of race and class? Racist structures certainly play a part in all facets of American society. However, these structures do not explain the similar lack of representation among four working class whites. In my experience as a member of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Talent Development Program, many, if not most, of my fellow participants were from ostensibly upper middle class and uh, upper class families. While the TDP aims to build a larger community of black and Latino classical musicians, it would seem that the institution of symphonic orchestras exists primarily within a certain class structure. What is the history of this, and how is this class dynamic replicated interracially and intraracially? On the topic of over-representation of Asian performers in symphonic orchestras, this over-representation <coughs> presents itself in far more complex forms than what is commonly stereotyped and as I talked about, the lack of representation from other Asian or Asiatic groups. Um, how does class play into this dynamic, and in what ways, if at all, do aspects of class and aspects of race, as well as aspects of nationalism and national identity, intersect to produce this particular uh, relationship of over and under representation? And two more questions. <coughs> when considering the participation of non-American uh, participation in American symphonic orchestras, does class and race intersect in similar ways for these performers? If we accept the notion that class plays a large role alongside race in the racial histories and dynamics of participation in American symphonic orchestras, what are the larger consequences of class and racial biases on performers in orchestras? And to this, I would cite, uh, I don't know if you all are aware of the controversy that was uh, caused by the president of the National Association for Music Educators uh, this past year, where he made some comments, uh, that's Michael Bort, uh, Butera, he made comments to the effect of there's not a lot of Latino and black representation in uh, classical institutions because they lack keyboard skills. What do we do about these kinds of questions? Thank you. Do you know like what he meant about like, keyboard skills? Like I don't understand. He is implying that classical music is not part of black and Latino culture, and that black and Latino people are generally unable to play the keyboard, and therefore are unlikely to be music educators and move up through the echelons of music education 
institutions in the United States. That's what he was saying. <laughs> questions? And I said these are the big questions that I have, and I'm only, I can only speak from personal experience and the limited amount of research that I've done into this particular topic. Yes? So, in my own experience in um, playing on ensembles um, as an amateur, um, one one, uh, one fundamental aspect that I think contributes to class divides is just the basic being able to purchase your supplies or your instrument or get a tutor. And um, I'm not really sure how those differences can be overcome besides um, through subsidy programs and things like that. Um, but that was like a really big difference that's separating me from some of my peers. It's interesting that you say that it's not something that, I, I guess this uh, reveals my own privilege, but it's not something that I had considered uh, when thinking about these questions. Um, being a bass player, basses and bass supplies are extremely expensive. <laughs> they just are. And it was kind of a miracle that my mom was able to provide me with basses. But the first bass that I got, she got off of eBay and for like $200. The second bass that uh, I got was maybe about $1,500, but this was uh, from a kind of a warehouse-ish instrument um, um, shop, and she kind of got cheated. We, we were um, just not familiar with the the culture that surrounds cl playing classical music. We were just unfamiliar. So this person who sold us the bass, I did my best to play it and try different basses and see how each one sounded and what I wanted. Uh, but he really <coughs> just kind of got one over on my mom in terms of that particular bass. If we had better, if we had had better connections, uh, to the community and the, cult, the classical music culture, I think we would have been better off. Eventually, we got, she got me another bass. And through, throughout this trajectory, um, our economic situation moved from a lower middle class to upper middle class uh, economic dynamics. So the higher in class that she was going and the more involved I became in these, um, really top-notch uh, symphonic institutions like the Atlanta Symphony and gain more <laughs> knowledge and resources, the better bases I was able to get and base supplies and whatnot. Whereas that one classmate that I had in, back in sixth grade who had started playing violin, I don't know if she was able to get better violins from just the regular old dumpy school violin. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I hadn't seen her you know, for many years, but, well, actually, I ran into her in at an orchestra competition. I was like, whoa, it's been a long time, but, you know, I can't say whether what her family situation was like and whether she had access to these kinds of uh, necessities, so that's a very interesting point um, that you bring up, and I think that's very true. Yeah. I think that I could see that even in my like middle school orchestra because they had instruments for everyone to use, but some kids their parents rented them um, <coughs> an instrument, and when they had just started playing, like they were like fourth graders or fifth graders who really didn't know much because they were just like playing around an instrument. Um, whereas the people were using just you know the school violins, and that like kind of continues as you go on and divide kind of gets bigger. And piggybacking off of that, I think that contributes to not only black and Latino participation, but like I had hinted at, also white participation in orchestras. If access to instruments it might necessarily determine your ability to participate in what most people might consider a hobby mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, having the resources to get those necessities and move on to ex extremely professional levels of uh, participation in these kinds of institutions. Yeah. 
Yes. So I, I think orchestras also as a non-profit organization, right? So they depend on the uh, donations from the rich mm -hmm. to support them. So they really don't have an incentive uh, to cater to anyone else except for the privileged. And on the flip side, uh, orchestras as institutions have this, uh, this image about them that they are uh, for the rich, that they were for the privileged. So the poor are also not really willing to uh, explore it, in a sense. So it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Not sure how that developed. Perhaps uh, historically, uh, there used to be just classical music, and then more uh, popular forms of music developed. So uh, orchestras became more of a, uh, the sphere of the orchestra has uh, shrunk down for the, uh, the middle class, the upper middle class, perhaps. Not really try to resolve that. I mean, I think that, um, like, especially, like, especially if we're focusing on American, like, symphonic orchestras, it, I think that, like, classical music being an upper class thing is, like, it's, like, it's, like, even more so in America than, like, in Europe. So that might also contribute to, yeah, just focusing on America. I wonder about that. Um, there are some books that I read um, for my comprehensive exams where I just like stuffed information into my brain over the period of a few months. But there are some uh, researchers out there who would posit that American orchestras, because of that degree of separation from the origination of European, um, Western European, the classical tradition, American or orchestras actually were in a very similar way to American bands, more for the people, of the people and for the people, and that there were community kind of community building things that, yes, could cater to the rich, but that's not necessarily what they were there for. They were more a community kind of building thing, especially during the Great Depression, especially during the World Wars, uh, where people, lots of people were gone and the people who were uh, left behind either worked to support the war or did other things, engaged in arts and whatnot. I think it's possible that the prestige of classical music as it exists in the United States now may have gotten to be that way through uh, America, America, winning the Second World War, in a sense, and being the dominant economic power uh, of the world. I think that influence made it so that with America's economy booming, people had more um, income to spend, and they were demanding more, better, higher class kind of things. Uh, this is just... Uh, some thoughts that are mulling around in my head based on some other research <coughs> I've come across. Do you know, like, sources sort of tracing the history of that? I do have a source. It's on my source list that has, like, 150. <laughs> 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 so I will find it. And <laughs> I will find it and uh, forward it your way. Yes. I think it's uh, interesting that a lot of your talk has been kind of refoc about refocusing this idea of race versus class, because I think as a people, um, I'm not sure if it's just particular to America, there seems to be this um, belief or this willingness to believe that there's just this fundamental biological difference or some sort of psychological difference between people of different races. And I think that permeates like a lot of our culture, and I just don't really know how you would necessarily be able to refocus the discussion on this issue. Well, that's a tough one, right? Uh, I think for those of us who may call ourselves advocates or may be interested in the business of increasing uh, participation among underrepresented groups in classical symphonic orchestras, and not necessarily just black and Latino, but also like Southeast Asian, South Asian, Pacific Islander, what have you, in American orchestras. Uh, I think it's important 
for us to combat these kind of silently held beliefs uh, about the culture among these different groups. Uh, Michael Butera, he did uh, music education, the world of music education in the United States, a favor by uh, espousing his bigoted, stupid remarks because it gave insight to how these kinds of ideas about uh, these underrepresented groups are entrenched not just among the audience, not just among the players, but as high as the institution goes, the president of this, of this educational institution. I think it's important that those of us who may call ourselves advocates be outspoken about uh, the city, be outspoken and necessarily nuanced about the different situations that these different groups face when trying to access uh, classical music. I think another element of uh, outreach is that initiation, right? Because classical music is a very complicated thing, and without prior education, it's very difficult for anyone to get into it. So, but at the same time, the, uh, the orchestra has to uphold some sort of a uh, artistic standard. For instance, uh, maybe they shouldn't, uh, as some people would say, maybe they shouldn't do these things where they accompany movies, for instance, or play more popular programs uh, in order to appeal to a larger audience. What do you think of that clash? I think that a plethora of approaches is a good thing, that we don't necessarily have to describe, subscribe to an either or situation. For some communities, playing Pops concerts works. It gets the people out. It gets people interested. Um, I partially became interested in playing orchestra from my friend uh, playing violin, but I became interested in classical music watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. I, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's a way that people uh, get into it. However, there's also, like you said, there is something to be said for um, raising technical and artistic uh, quality of the orchestras themselves so that people get into it and stay in it, that it doesn't fall off by the wayside. And coming from a different angle, providing the resources for people to stay in it despite or in spite of whatever their economic situation or their class situation may be. Um, I don't think that subscribing to an either or uh, approach is healthy if we're going to maintain, uh, if we're going to maintain, not only maintain, but also increase the profile of uh, classical music and symphonic orchestras in the United States. Just out of curiosity, what was the response to uh, what Michael Patera said? Oh, oh uh, he, he resigned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a letter, the, the comments that he made, the people he made them to, uh, one of the guys, he detailed what happened and put it on Facebook, and you know how that goes. <laughs> so uh, it really blew up, went viral. Um, people kept sharing and sharing. The guy posted a picture of himself, like tearing his member card in half and like burning it. And it, it, it was a really, I can imagine, just extremely painful and shocking, uh, and just like, disappointing mm -hmm. kind of situation to be in. That this person who's in charge of this entire organization would have these kinds of views, and then you have to wonder how much his views are trickle down to the other levels of the organization. Um, but there was a large outcry about, what, about his comments and people were signing petitions um, for him to resign, to apologize and resign. And people involved in many different music education um, 
uh, backgrounds all over the country, and he did eventually resign. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when did he say that? This was, uh, I think this was early in the summer. I, I have to uh, uh, go back and look because during that time I was pregnant and or having a baby. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the time just kind of like <laughs> becomes a fog for me during that time, but I do believe it was during the summer. Like this past summer? Yes, this year. Oh. This year. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question. I know we're talking about classical music, but it's interesting to me that um, in jazz music, it's like a lot of the same instruments that you'll see in orchestras, but they're so they're over represented while and over represented by black people, mm -hmm. and and people of uh, lower classes especially. So I was trying to like try to figure out how that tended to happen. You know. I would venture a guess that jazz music tends to be considered a music of the people, a music of the folk. And I would put a little asterisk next to that because there is jazz music for everybody mm -hmm. and then there is jazz music for upper class people. Um, st studying under Tom Knipic, who is the bass teacher, he was the teacher who taught all the base students at Western Michigan University, but also the head of the jazz studies department. When they would put on their jazz concerts, the audience members who would attend those jazz concerts tended to be the same audience members who would attend the orchestra concerts. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he also played at a local club that uh, catered to a different uh, social group, I would say. Um, and so I would, con I would put jazz under a kind of music of the people in, in a similar way that country music is, bluegrass and pop, um, that these are musics of the people, of the folk, of the masses, whereas classical music, uh, as you said earlier, tends to be more viewed as music of the privileged. So do you think that like black and Latino artists, they go into jazz more often than classical music because of the audience then? Or like who's, who really consumes music on a larger scale? Um, the thing about that is, is that I think jazz music, because it caters to a more generalized um, class group, um, it's going to be overrepresented by black and Latino people, especially considering that jazz is descended from black cultural music and whatnot. Uh, however, with that said, like I said, you can see the same thing with country music um, uh, for white people who engage in country or bluegrass music. There's going to be a few who don't do that. They go the classical route. And that's why I say that we need to bring in issues of class when it comes to that. Um, whereas uh, classical music is perceived as not only a privileged, uh, economically privileged venture, but also a white venture. Uh, band music. Uh, and jazz music is more seen as, oh, this is what we're supposed to do. This is something that we can access. This is something that's more familiar um, for historical reasons. It's going to be more familiar. Um, and also regional, I think regional influences, especially when you're talking about music institutions in the South, um, where high school, college bands are what's hot. Right. That's, that's what's going to get people out and like, battle with the bands. That is a major event. Right. So people are going to go uh, to what's popular, right? And what's popular, music of the people, populous, popular music of the people, that would be jazz, right? right. Yeah. So that's, the, that's what I think uh, 
is the case. But it's something that I would definitely love to do more actual, like, in-depth uh, ethnographic research into. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> do you think classical music can be music of the people? For instance, every time I ask somebody to uh, maybe go to the symphony, one of the first questions that come out is, do I have to dress up? Right. And then that is just intimidating because there's so much ceremony and these unnecessary extra things yeah. surrounding it. Do you think it can be the music of the people? I don't know. <laughs> to tell you the truth. Is that an integral part of classical music, the, the sense of the occasion? I think, you know what? I think it can be. It has become music of the people in a sense historically. Before it was music of the courts, um, the royals. They were, the only aristocrats were listening to the classical music. And then uh, industrialization and uh, the enlightenment came about and it started opening up to the masses. And that's when you had Mozart Playing, uh, making music not just for the courts, but for the masses. Um, and over time, with the introduction of different new music genres uh, and the dominance of American uh, popular music, not only in the United States, but around the world, um, and that's just due to the, lots of other political reasons. I think classical music the people have moved from classical music to popular music. I think classical music still can be music of the people, but it, it as an institution needs to appeal to the people. And what does that look like? Pop concerts? Maybe. But it, I think it could be other things as well, in addition to pop concerts, in addition to playing along movies, uh, uh, in addition to playing along video games, uh, soundtracks and whatnot. I think there is room for improvement and development, but it will take uh, conscious, a conscious effort to figure out what exactly the people want and how classical music can play a role in that. That's about it, right? <laughs> um, so thank you guys. Thank you again.